So now let's take a look at the relationship between breathing and posture and how breathing can affect our posture, but also how our posture can affect the way that we breathe. Now in the previous videos right at the start, we looked at what should be happening within the body when we take a nice big deep breath in, so an inhalation and exhalation with regards to what happens in terms of the movement of the diaphragm. So when we breathe in, just to recap, we get that bow down of the diaphragm and those external intercostals to initiate that lift and expansion of the rib cage. And then we've got those secondary muscles, which are the ones through the neck, the chest, up in the upper back and in the upper neck, which help us with when we're in oxygen debt. So they are primarily helping to lift the rib cage in short, shallow breaths when we're breathing heavily, when we're working out, but they can also act as like the accessory movers to the rib cage to help us lift and get a little bit more um, volume into the chest when we take that nice big deep breath in. But when we look at that also in relationship to posture and the body, as we're breathing in, what else should be happening with the rest of our limbs as we're taking a nice big inhalation? Good question, we're gonna take a look at that now. So when we take a nice big deep breath in, so when we inhale, we also tend to couple those movements with what we refer to as extension, abduction, and then supination or supination, however you want to pronounce it with the body. If you're not sure what those terms mean, no drama, I'm gonna explain it now, but for those of you that like to understand things a little bit more technically, they're the movements that we associate it with. So when we breathe in, we wanna extend the body, which is basically lifting the body up, so making the body taller. Abduction is basically the movement of limbs away from the body. So I always remember this, like being abducted by aliens. It's abduction. The aliens are coming in and they're taking you away. So you're taking your limbs away from the body. And then we've got supination or supination, which is basically like an open up of the body. So when we take that nice big deep breath in, we get that nice big lift and expansion of the rib cage. We want the body to do like a similar thing. So as we breathe in, we just basically want to think we're getting longer, bigger, taller and open. And then with that exhalation, we spoke about how it's the reverse of what we happen in the rib cage. So it's naturally that depression down of the rib cage as that diaphragm ascends and those, that deeper core muscle, that TVA squeezes in. And if you look at my posture here, that's basically the reverse of what we've just done. So then when we breathe out, it's the reverse. So it's flexion. So moving the body forward, adduction, so before we were taking the limbs away from the body, now we're adding them back into the midline of the body. So adduction and then pronation, which is the opposite of supination. So pronation is then sort of rolling the body in. So more moving more now towards that really bent over and into sort of like the fetal position. So inhalation, with that lift and that expansion of the rib cage, we also lift the body up and make it taller, longer, bigger and open. And then with exhalation, as that rib cage just then naturally wants to depress down, we follow that movement with the rest of the body, we flex, so we bend forward, we curl the body in and we move towards the fetal position. So what we're gonna do now is put that into practice with an exercise called a breathing squat. And we're gonna use that breathing pattern to move with making the body taller, longer, bigger when we breathe in and then breathing out, making the body shorter and smaller. So the squat is a really nice one to do this with because it mimics that movement quite nicely. So find yourself in a squat position. Remember everyone's squat position is different. Um, we're just gonna do an air squat, so a body weight squat here. But what I want you to think about doing is first, we're gonna follow the correct breathing pattern. So as you're stood up tall here, you're gonna take a nice big deep breath in. So you're gonna breathe in, make the body really nice and long and tall and open the body up. And then as you breathe out, you're gonna drop down into that body weight squat position and you can allow the body to kind of round in and those shoulders to curl in a little bit here. And then we're gonna reverse that. So we're gonna come back up, big deep breath in. Inhale, make the body longer, taller, bigger. Open the body up and then exhale, curl the body in. So I just want you to practice that for a couple of breaths here and really get in tune with how we can use the breath to support postural movement in the body. I will probably just preface this very quickly. I'm not gonna go into an in-depth explanation with this because this will be covered in the relationship with breathing and strength training. But when we start to move um, movement into the gym and particularly when we're starting to look at strength training, breathing patterns change because we need to make sure we're doing things like bracing the abdominals and protecting the lower back and engaging the core 
especially when we're lifting heavy loads. So our breathing pattern will change. Um, again, that's out of the scope of this video, but just bear that in mind. So obviously whilst we're doing more gentle body weight exercises, this is a wonderful breathing pattern to get into. But if you are someone that goes to the gym and particularly someone who engages in strength training, please be mindful that there are slightly different breathing patterns involved when you're lifting heavy weights. Um, so now what I want you to do is reverse that. So now I want you to do the breathing squat again, except this time you're going to do the opposite of ideally what we should see in the body. So now as you go down and you go down into that squat, so as you're making the body shorter and smaller and curling into that fetal position, you're going to take a breath in or you're going to try to take a deep breath in. And then as you stand up, you're going to breathe out. So now you're going to stand up, breathe out, open the body up. So breath in as we curl down. And just go as deep as, as you is comfortable for you. We're not looking at getting like technically perfect squats here. That's not what this is about. It's just to start to feel that movement. So if it helps, after you've done that, you can go back to doing a couple of reps with how it should be. So breathing in as we come up out of the squat, breathing out as we go down. And notice the difference. Now for me, when I do it, I definitely notice when I reverse the breathing pattern that it feels a lot more labored. I find it a lot harder to actually take a nice big deep breath in as I'm going down into the squat. And it feels a lot more difficult and a lot more effortful is probably the word I would use to do it, to just then bring myself out of that position whilst I'm trying to breathe out. Now, if we look at that in terms of what happens in the body when we breathe out, this is where we can also start to make the connection with posture and why that's so important. And the reason why it feels so difficult if we're trying to breathe in getting down into the squat, because from this position here, if I go sideways on so you can see my body, I've just done a big breath out. <sighs> What's happened to my rib cage? it's gone down, right? Because that's the movement we associate with exhalation. Now, if I have a slumped body posture or I'm trying to take a big deep breath in when I'm going down into a squat like this, why is that ineffective? Because I'm in the position of exhalation, right? This is how my body wants to move when I breathe out, not when I breathe in. So for somebody who has a slumped posture, maybe you're someone that sits down all day, maybe you're on a computer, maybe you do a lot of driving through the day and you're naturally finding yourself in this position, what you'll find is happening is that you're putting yourself in a position of exhalation all day. And why is that a problem? Because we've just explored in order for us to get the full potential of our breath in, we need to lift the body up and open the body out, which is impossible, right? If we're like this all day, just try it now. So slump your shoulders forward and just try and take a big deep breath in. It's difficult, right? You definitely get to a point where you're like, I can't go any further. Now, if you do the same thing and now as you open up, take that breath, You'll probably even hear it with mine as it's going through the microphone that my breath lasts longer and it goes deeper. So this is really, really crucial for anybody who's watching this that makes a connection there with your posture and making sure that you're putting yourself in the optimal position in order for you to get the most optimal breath every time you breathe in. And this is also where we can start to connect those dots again, what we've been doing through the previous videos and associate our potential posture and the way we're breathing with pain in the body. Because if we're constantly finding ourselves in this slumped position over time, we're going to beat up the front of the shoulder. So we're going to get a bit of wear and tear through here. We're going to get a lot of tightness in the chest because everything through the front here gets short and tight, but then everything through the back and the top here gets lengthened out a little bit. So we might start presenting with pain in the shoulders, in the chest, potentially through the sternum maybe in the upper back, you might also be presenting with something like headaches. So this is why understanding your relationship to posture and your breath is super important for your overall health and well-being and just making sure that you're moving effectively. And the last thing I wanted to cover here is the relationship with the forward head posture, right? So how our breathing can affect the posture of our head. Now we're gonna relate this back to the discussion we had about Western A Price right at the beginning of this course, because this is crucial information to understand and tie back in here. So through Western A Price's discoveries of the introduction of foods, so processed foods, white sugar, white flour, pasteurized milk and processed table salt, what he referred to as the white devils or the four white devils. The introduction of that started to create 
deformities in the development of nasal passages. So the reason why this is important, because if anybody has a underdeveloped nasal passage, then that's going to affect their ability to breathe in through their nose. And the reason why this is a problem, if I go sideways on here so you can see, if I have an issue with my nasal passage and I'm unable to effectively take air through here, the way that my body compensates then is by driving my head forward to try and open my airways. I open my mouth and then I mouth breathe because <sighs> that's the only way I can get oxygen in. Now, if you remember what we spoke about in the video previous when we were looking at stress, what happens when we mouth breathe? We chest breathe. So when we breathe through the mouth, we start to only take those short, shallow breaths into the chest because we're unable to use the diaphragm to get deeper into the belly and do diaphragmatic breaths. So when we mouth breathe, we chest breathe. When we chest breathe, we turn on the sympathetic nervous system. When we turn on the sympathetic nervous system, we're getting that constant influx of stress hormones on the body, which over time is bad for us because it starts to break the body down. The other thing then to maybe just tie back in here too as well is the relationship then between diet and lifestyle with that. So yes, if you are somebody who has an underdeveloped nasal passage or you've been affected by that, that is obviously a structural issue. That's something that cannot be changed through diet and lifestyle alone. You're going to need some kind of intervention there or if it's an issue through like the development of the arches in the mouth, you're looking at something like dentistry or obviously a surgeon or someone who can deal with the widening and opening of nasal passages, okay? That aside, if we look at then how diet and lifestyle can affect that, it's only going to take something super simple like an intolerance to a certain food and dairy is probably a common one I throw in here which a lot of people get like stuffy noses with which is then like an increase or an um, inflammatory response in the mucous membranes in your nose. If you are someone who has an underdeveloped nasal passage and you're also eating foods that are causing you an intolerance and you're getting swelling in your mucous membranes, that is going to close down the space in your nasal passage even more, which is going to encourage even more of a forward head posture and a mouth breathing position, which as we've already spoken about, creates a lot of dysfunction up here. So pain through the upper part of the body, the chest, the shoulders, the neck, headaches, that kind of stuff. And then also turning on the sympathetic nervous system. So it's important for people to start looking at their dietary interventions and their lifestyle interventions to help them with something like this. Now, a cool little test that you can do just to see how well your face has developed in thirds. This is also something from Weston A. Price. He noticed that people's face should kind of develop symmetrically in thirds evenly. So a way to test this, if you take your hand, you just kind of tuck the thumb into the side of the palm of your hand here and we're using this space here. So the tip of the thumb and the tip of the index finger. Now obviously if you've got nails you need to be mindful of this because it's not the length of your nail, it's the length of the tip of your finger. So you won't be able to do this that effectively if you've got massive long nails or you just need to be mindful of that and tuck them out the way. But what you want to do is put the tip of your thumb underneath your chin and then line your index finger up with the base of your nose. So if the bottom third of your face is developed correctly, then that should fit nicely into that position there. So as you can see here, mine's developed quite well there. If it was um, underdeveloped or there were any issues there, then you might see that your um, finger doesn't quite reach your nose or that it reaches further than the nose. But remember, we're keeping the thumb tucked in here. We're not opening the thumb up. So there. Then from that position there, we move to the middle third of the face. Now, this is where people tend to have issues. So if you look closely here for me, so thumb under the nose, and then we take that index finger just between the eyebrows. Now, in an ideal situation for a well-developed middle third, that index finger should sit kind of just above the eyebrows, just in between and above the eyebrows. You can see, you see I have to modify my hand for me to fit there. So here you can see my finger goes a little bit higher than probably what's most ideal for a well-developed middle third of my face. So there's been some underdevelopment here. I was a child that, yes, whilst I also was very fortunate enough to um, be brought up on home cooked meals. We had a vegetable patch in the garden and stuff like that. I also ate cereals. I also ate white bread and sandwiches and I frosties were one of my favorite things to eat as a kid covered in sugar. So there were definitely um, big elements of my diet where I was brought up on white sugar, white flour products, um, I don't think there was a lot of table salt in there, but then there was definitely pasteurized milk. That's what I would put on my breakfast most mornings, right? So potentially a link there for me in the way that the middle of my, the, the middle third of my face is developed. And then the top third, we put that thumb between the, um, 
eyebrows and then we take that index finger just to the top of the head and then it should make, meet you kind of just where your hairline is. So you can see there that's relatively um, even there for me. So it's mostly just this part of my face that there's a little bit of an underdevelopment. And you can also see I had crowding in my bottom teeth here, which is another symptom of that, of being exposed to those kinds of foods and then the defects that can create in the development of our mouth because our dental arches don't develop correctly. And then the main symptom of that is crowding of the teeth, which I'm sure pro most of you could probably either resonate with that or you see it quite prolifically in your friends and your family. Um, so yeah, that is looking at posture and breathing and the connection there. So if you're someone that resonates with some of the information through here, start looking at ways that you can start to incorporate breath into movement to make sure you're using the breath to help support the way your body moves when you're doing things, making the body taller and longer and bigger when we breathe in and making the body shorter and smaller when we breathe out. But also start to address issues with posture if you notice that that's something that you struggle with to make sure that you're then able to effectively get good breaths in during the day.